Let's wait until everybody gets settled. How did it go on the exam? Too easy. Huh? Too easy. He thinks it was too easy. How many burgers did you Huh? How many burgers did you score? A few. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Yeah, if you are asking your friends, you know, about some question, you might not get the right answer because there were variations of the problem, so they were all very similar but had slight variations. Yes? Uh, hopefully, I'm hoping that by tomorrow, but if not uh, by Thursday, we're almost done grading, so as uh, soon as uh, one of the TAs finishes grading, um, we'll be ready. So he thought it was pretty easy. Anybody thought it was pretty hard? You thought it was very hard? You too? So, so. It could have been harder, yeah. <laughs> could have been easier too, but. Any questions about the exam? Okay, so um, again, uh, the, uh, res the, your scores will be posted, if not uh, late today, sometime tomorrow. And, uh, and I'll also post some of the solutions so you can look at the problems. But, uh, but now we have to move on into the study of the second law. So let me switch this on here. This is uh, pretty much what you could consider the second half of the course, even though we actually did the split a chapter earlier in the um, study of the first law for uh, open systems. But now this is really a different law, a different set of properties that we're going to be looking at. So if I ask you what property you associate the first law of thermodynamics with, what would you say? Heat. Huh? Heat. G? No, heat. Uh, but heat, is heat a property? I thought it was. Well, I should have asked that question then on the exam. Uh, heat is not a property, right? So what property do you associate the first law of thermodynamics with? Energy. Energy, right? energy is a property, energy. So, and everybody, well, almost everybody has that association in their head that the first law of thermodynamics is really an equation of conservation of energy. Uh, but the second law of thermodynamics is a little bit different, and students have always a very hard time at the beginning understanding what it means. It is associated with another property. Does anybody know what it is? What property? Entropy. So as part of our study of the second law, we'll have to learn a little bit about this other property called entropy and how the second law relates to that. But we approach the second law in a slightly different manner. Uh, there are several concepts, again, that we need to look at in order to understand the second law. So I'm going to start by describing some of those concepts. And I'm going to do it in connection with two devices that will be uh, very primary devices for us to study the second law of thermodynamics. Let me uh, suppose that I have some uh, high temperature energy source without really being specific as to what it is. Let's say that I have here a, let's call it T sub H, and this is a supply of energy for me of, at a high temperature. And suppose that I have a device that for now it will just be a black box, but I have this device here. And this is a machine, and this machine is operating in cycles. So whatever is happening inside this black box, presumably there is some working fluid that is helping us running that device, but it's operating in a cycle. That is, it goes through a series of consecutive states over and over and over. So I take a certain amount of energy from this high temperature reservoir, and let me call that then Q sub H. This is heat now. This energy being transferred from the high temperature reservoir into my device. And then because of the way my device operates, it delivers for me a certain amount of usable work. So 
So I get some work out of this device. I put energy into it from the high temperature reservoir. It delivers work for me. And then uh, what happens is that not all, of, not all of the energy that I put in, and we'll study that later, but not all, not all of the energy that I put in will be delivered as work. So there will be some extra energy that has to be rejected. And let's say that that is rejected down here to a low temperature reservoir that I'll call T sub uh, L. So that device is one of the two devices that we're going to be looking at as we study the second law. And it's called a heat engine. This is a generic description of a heat engine. So you can describe it as a device that operates in a cycle, receives energy from a high temperature reservoir, delivers a net amount of work, and rejects some leftover energy to a low temperature reservoir. The other device is pretty much the opposite of this. So suppose, suppose that I do the opposite. So now I have a low temperature reservoir here just like I had there, T sub L. I'm going to take energy from the low temperature reservoir, and that energy is going to go into this other device that is also operating in a cycle. And I denote that by putting this arrow inside here, inside of my device. And what the device is doing for me is now delivering energy into a high temperature reservoir like we had the first time. So this is T sub H. So you can see the difference. Go back to the heat engine. It took a certain amount of energy from the high temperature reservoir. I called that energy Q sub H delivered a certain amount of work, and there was a leftover, and I didn't write it here, but there was a leftover uh, energy, which will be transferred as heat to the low temperature reservoir, Q sub L. So now we're doing the opposite. We're taking energy from the low temperature reservoir, Q sub L, and we are delivering energy to the high temperature reservoir, Q sub H. But in order for this machine to do that, you must put some work into it. So you must actually reverse the direction of the work. Now you must do work on the device, on the fluid that is operating inside this device for this machine to do this. And um, what do we call this machine? What is this machine doing? What would you call it? It's like a refrigerator, it's like a refrigerator right? It's taking uh, energy from a low temperature reservoir and putting it in a high temperature reservoir. So this is a refrigerator. Let's put it right here. Or another name that we can use for the same type of device is a heat pump. So it's a refrigerator or heat pump. It really depends on what the objective of the device is. If the objective of the device is to remove energy from the low temperature reservoir, Q sub L, then we think of it as a refrigerator. But if the objective of the device is to put a certain amount of heat in some high temperature reservoir and that heat is Q sub H, then we refer to it as a heat pump. So the difference really, although there, is quite, there could be quite significant differences in how the device is constructed, uh, whether you are looking at the extraction of heat from a cold temperature reservoir or the addition of heat to a high temperature reservoir is what defines whether it's a, you, you think of it as a refrigerator or as a heat pump. So we have those two devices that are, I don't know if I can, oh yeah, I can feed them side by side. That will be the two devices that we're going to be looking at as we examine, as we begin to examine the second law of thermodynamics.
All right. So let's define them more properly. I just did, uh, but let's write it down. The definition of the heat engine and the definition of the heat pump. So the heat engine operates in a thermodynamic cycle. We saw the circular arrow inside. It delivers a net, a net amount of work. We saw that, the work coming out of the heat engine. And it transfers heat from a high temperature reservoir to a low temperature reservoir. That's a heat engine. And the refrigeration, the refrigerator or the heat pump does the opposite. So it takes energy from a low temperature reservoir, transfers it to a high temperature reservoir, and it uh, takes in a certain amount of work. Those are our two devices. Now, you also saw that I drew those um, kind of cloud-looking reservoirs. Let me flash this for a second. My high temperature reservoir and my low temperature reservoir. Let's define what those are. That's here at the bottom what a thermal reservoir is, the way we think of a thermal reservoir, is a system, by itself is a system, because remember a system is any amount of mass. So it's a system that is large enough that we can think of it as remaining at constant temperature while it receives energy or gives away energy in the form of heat transfer. So it's large enough that if it gives a certain amount of heat that is needed for a process elsewhere, it doesn't change its temperature. So the common examples are a large body of water, a very large ocean, Think of, thinking of it as a constant temperature ocean, uh, lake, river, or the atmosphere. You know, if we think of the atmosphere for many processes that we're interested in, we can think of it as being at a constant temperature, at least during the time that our process takes place. So there is obviously nothing that is exactly like a thermal reservoir, but there are many things that approximate a thermal reservoir. So that's, that's what a thermal reservoir is in thermodynamics. Any questions? Okay, so, um, so what's inside this heat engine? What's inside this black box? Well, we actually have already seen it before, and here's an example that we saw earlier. This is what would be happening inside the black box. There is the hot reservoir up here, the cold reservoir down here, and here now represented inside this dashed line is my heat engine. And this is just one example. We have seen this when we were looking at power plants. This is a very simple schematic of a power plant. It consists of a boiler, a turbine, a condenser, and a pump. And you can see the features that I had in the cartoon are all there. So there is a amount of heat, Q sub H, that comes from the hot reservoir and it happens to go into the boiler. And there is a certain amount of heat, Q sub L, that goes out into the cold reservoir and it happens to come out of the condenser. And then you can see that the turbine delivers work and the only thing that is here that was not in the cartoon is that this pump here receives some work. But when we think of this work in the cartoon, we're thinking of net amount of work. So you can add here to the cartoon to avoid that confusion. Just put W net. So there is a net delivery, meaning that the work that is delivered by the turbine should be larger than the work that is needed to operate the pump so that the device is actually delivering a net amount of work. Okay, so, and then suppose that we say, well, let's see what this looks like on a thermodynamic chart. And, you know, remember this is a boiler, so we think that there is probably liquid going into the boiler at number two, there is steam going out at number three at high pressure, then steam coming out at a low pressure, goes through the condenser, comes out as liquid, and then goes through the pump. So if you think of that as happening, for, for example, say water, then it might look something like this. So here is a PV diagram of the working fluid that is going through this heat engine. So there is two at the entrance to the boiler. 
it comes in in this particular sketch is, is coming in a saturated liquid. So number two is right there on the saturation line. So it's saturated liquid as it comes into the boiler, comes out as saturated vapor out of the boiler, goes into the turbine, comes down at four with some high quality. Notice how the pressure drops, right? So from the boiler pressure, this is a PV diagram, so this is the boiler pressure up here, and this is the condenser pressure down here. So as it goes through the turbine, it drops from the boiler pressure to the condenser pressure. Goes through the condenser. In this example, not all of it condenses, so it goes from high quality to some low quality, but it's still a mixture of liquid and vapor at one when it comes out of the condenser, and then you put it through the pump. This is an idealization because in reality you wouldn't want to do it this way. In practice, you wouldn't want to put any of this vapor through the pump. You want to make it all liquid. So just, this is just a very simple example of what a PV diagram for a heat engine involving water in a two-phase cycle would look like. And then from what you have learned uh, before, you can also see I dashed uh, the inside of this figure here because that's the net work. In the examples that you have done so far, the problems that you have done so far, there was only a process, say from one to two, if you wanted to find the work, you just found the area under the curve. But now we really have four processes, so there are four uh, separate instances where work is being done. So if, if you were just doing from two to three, then sure it would be the work, the area under that curve all the way down to the axis from two to three, that rectangle that you would form there. The same thing from four to one. So from four to one, the work would be the area under this line that goes from four to one, and that's also a rectangle. But that's negative work, because you're integrating from four to one that's because that's work that is going into the system. And the same thing can be said about the work from three to four and the work from one to two. The work from three to four being positive, but the work from one to two is negative. So, uh, so when you look at the inside, then you have the, the work. Okay. Um, Let's see. All right, so let's now define a few more things. Uh, what, let's talk about efficiencies. Let me write it here. Efficiency of a heat engine. Let's call it eta and to see how it would be a convenient way to define it. If we go back to the original um, cartoon with the heat engine, how, what, how would you define this engine to be really very efficient? What would be the ideal scenario if you were to say that this engine is very, very efficient? The maximum possible efficiency. If it's 100 percent, but how do you define a quantity that it'll be 100 percent? Q out or Q L in my notation here is zero. Okay? So the, the ideal engine would be one where whatever amount of heat I put in as Q sub H is delivered as work W net without any rejection to the low temperature reservoir Q sub L. So that is, that would be in fact the ideal. Uh, device. So in view of that, how should we define, if we were to form a ratio, what ratio should we form to define eta? It would have to be the network divided by QH, because that's the heat that is going in. Okay. So take the network out in this diagram divided by the Q sub H. If that happens to be one or 100%, then that's our best um, engine. So that's how we define the efficiency of a heat engine. We can write this in a slightly different way uh, if we use the first law of thermodynamics. So 
from the first law, I can connect all these three. And in fact, you probably have already done it in your head. How can I connect these three quantities, QH, WNet, and QL, using the first law of thermodynamics? Minus QL equals W net. That's an energy balance. And it's obvious from the cartoon. Energy going in, energy going out. If I subtract them, I must have whatever work was done, because energy has to be conserved. So the first law of thermodynamics tells me this. And therefore, if I use this here, then I can write the efficiency as Instead of writing W net, I can write QH minus QL over QH. Hold on. Or just divide by QH, 1 minus QL over QH. Yes? Is that assuming that there's no change in internal energy? OK, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. Am I assuming, he's wondering, is that because we're assuming that there is no change in internal energy? Because you're wondering, he wrote the first law here, and there is no U, right? Why is there no U there? What is the answer to that question? Cycle. It's a cycle, right? It's a cycle. So it's like I'm writing the first law for one cycle. So if I do it for one cycle, that system inside, the delta U is zero. Or I can do it for two cycles, three cycles, n cycles. As long as I do it for an um, integer multiple of, uh, of a cycle, then delta U is zero. And that's why. All right, so I, I get this expression for the efficiency. All right, um, so let's save that and do the same thing for a refrigeration cycle. So save this is the efficiency of a heat engine. For those of you who like putting the important things in boxes, you can put it in a box. Although I would also put this in a box because this is the actual definition of the efficiency. The last expression is just by manipulating it using the first law of thermodynamics. But let's do the same thing for the refrigerator. So let me bring back the refrigeration cartoon here. And think about how we could define something similar to an efficiency. It's just that we don't call it an efficiency for a refrigerator. We, we give it a different name. Um, so how would you define it? What would be the ideal situation here? That might not happen, but it would be what we would desire. No work has to be done, no to be done right? Because it would be great to have a refrigerator that you don't have to plug in or you don't need to put batteries in. It just does the job for you for free. That would be the ideal scenario. So obviously, uh, this is what is costing us. This is what is costing us. In fact, if we go back to the heat engine, another way to look at this definition is we're saying, this is what we want. We have what we want on top divided by the cost, right? In the case of the heat engine, that's obvious. This is what we want. We want work out of the heat engine. This is what we need to spend, the energy that goes in, right? So if we think in the same terms, what we want versus what it costs, how would you define something equivalent to an efficiency for this? What is it that you want if it's a refrigerator? Q sub L, if it's a refrigerator. If it's a heat pump, you want Q sub H. But let's think of a refrigerator, refrigerator first. So Q sub L, and what is it that it costs? It costs W. So if we form the same ratio, if we do, um, if we do um, what we want versus what it costs, then the ratio is for the refrigerator is uh, Q sub L 
divided by the work that went in, this, this W. Okay, so, and that would be our efficiency, except we don't call it efficiency, we call it coefficient of performance. So let me write it here. Coefficient of performance. And I think uh, we're gonna use probably uh, beta. And I'll just put an R there, uh, meaning that it's for a refrigerator. All right? So sometimes it's also referred to as COP. You'll see it many times, COP. So let's put that here, COP, coefficient of performance, or beta sub R, Q sub L over W. Now let's use the first law again. If I write the first law here for this cartoon, what does the first law tell me? What's W? It has to be QH minus QL. Right? Just do up energy balance in your head. Right? This, go, this goes in, so it has to be the difference between those two. This going out, this going in. Again, for a cycle, delta U will be zero, so, so I can write that. So if I put that into my definition of the coefficient of performance, then it becomes Q sub L over Q sub H minus Q sub L. So that's of course different from the expression that we had for the heat engine, because it's a different device. That's the coefficient of performance of our refrigerator. Now note there is a significant difference. If you go back to the heat engine, the quote unquote ideal situation gives me an efficiency of one. Right? Everything that I put in comes out as work without any loss. Here the situation is a little bit different because here in the ideal scenario, I take heat from the cold reservoir, deliver it to the hot reservoir and I don't do any work. So it's get, it gets transferred for free and therefore um, W would be zero. The ideal again, quote unquote, coefficient of performance would be infinity. So the, the, the best coefficient of performance, if I don't want to spend anything, is infinity. Whereas the, in the heat engine, the best one, according to this definition, is one or 100%. Because of course you could, you, you could argue, well, what about you define the heat engine that does work but you don't put anything in? Right? You just have this, the thing there, the heat engine there delivering work and you don't have to put anything in there. The problem with that is that it violates what? If it's just giving you work without you putting any energy in. Conservation huh? Conservation it violates the first law of thermodynamics. So what we want to do is we want to have a machine that obeys the first law. And the only way to do it is the way we have just done it. This refrigerator that moves heat for free with an infinity coefficient of performance doesn't violate the first law of thermodynamics. You're still conserving energy because energy going in, energy going out. But we know it cannot happen, and that's what the second law is going to tell us in more detail. Okay, uh, so, so far we got these definitions to remember. Any questions? If you want to look at uh, what a refrigeration cycle might look like, well, here is a one that we may have seen at least once before. So that would be what's inside the black box of a refrigerator. So now you have a condenser, an expansion valve, an evaporator, and a compressor. The, system, I mean the device removes energy from the low temperature reservoir in the evaporator. So energy comes in from the low temperature reservoir, which would be down here. That's my Q sub L. Goes into the evaporator, evaporates the refrigerant. Then that refrigerant goes into the compressor. Then it goes into a condenser. In the condenser, it goes from vapor to liquid. 
So it releases heat into the high temperature reservoir, then expansion valve back to the evaporator. And of course, the work that we need to put in comes in the compressor. There's, that's where you have to do the work. We should also define the coefficient of performance for a heat pump, and that's actually very easy. Let me just add it to this page. Let me write here for this one the word refrigerator. If I can find my black pen again, here it is. So this is for the refrigerator, the beta sub R. But suppose we want to do it for a heat pump, how would you define the coefficient of performance of a heat pump? QH over, yeah, or W, to first, first W, just like we did before, uh, is that now we're interested in QH, not QL. And then, yeah, using the first law, we can do the same thing. We can write W as QH minus QL. And we can put that in a box. So now we have the three definitions. The efficiency of a heat pump, I'm sorry, the efficiency of a heat engine, and then the coefficient of performance of a refrigerator and the coefficient of performance of a heat pump. Right. And we're starting to get some idea as to what's possible and what's not possible, just from instinct. Because we know we have to plug in the refrigerator. Uh, what is not so obvious to us, that's very obvious when you tell the student the refrigerator, you have to plug it in. Uh, so therefore, there will be some work in. What is not immediately obvious is the case of the heat engine. It's not really that obvious that there has to be this heat rejected. You know, you could argue, why not? I can put the heat in and it comes out as work, all of it. All of this energy that I put in comes out as work. But the second law of thermodynamics tells you that that's not possible, that there'll have to be some heat that gets lost. Okay, so now let's go ahead and state the, the second law. Not surprisingly, what happens is that now we state the second law in reference to these two devices. So we have two statements, one for each device. So we call this the second law statements. The first one is called the Kelvin-Planck statement. And I'll abbreviate it uh, KP, K-P for Kelvin-Planck. And the second one is called the Clausius statement, or just C, when we refer to it in short. The first statement, the uh, Kelvin-Planck statement, deals with a heat engine, so the first device that we saw. Whereas the second one, the Clausius statement, deals with a refrigerator. But they are equivalent, and that's not obvious, but I'll show you later on that they're actually equivalent. Even though they're dealing with two different devices, they are equivalent. Here's the Kelvin-Planck statement in its full statement. It's essentially telling you something that we already discussed when we were looking at the heat engine. It's saying it's impossible to make a device which operates in a cycle and delivers a net amount of work while exchanging energy heat with a single reservoir. So in other words, it's telling you that the efficiency of a heat engine cannot be what? 100%. Right? That's exactly what it's telling you. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. If you haven't written it down, don't worry. Uh, so there was the heat engine. It's telling you that you cannot build such a device without this bottom part. Right? Operates in a cycle delivers a net amount of work while exchanging energy, in this case receiving the energy from a single reservoir, the high temperature reservoir. So it's impossible to make a device which operates in a cycle and delivers a net amount of work while exchanging energy heat with a single reservoir. Or if you think in terms of the definition of efficiency, again, it's telling you that, that the efficiency cannot be one 
or 100%. That you will need to exchange energy with a low temperature reservoir. They'll have to be a Q sub L. Q sub L cannot be zero. So there is the little cartoon. It's just what I just showed you. If I just have a device that operates in a cycle and delivers an n amount of work while exchanging energy, again, in this case, receiving energy from a single reservoir, that's impossible. Can't do that. That's the Second, the statement of the second law known as the Kelvin-Planck statement, right? Does anybody have a question? Yes? How far are we? Like, what's our efficiency at right now? Oh, well, it depends on the, what, you know, an automobile is, what, 25, 30%? You know, so, very bad. <laughs> but, you know, other things can be a little better. Uh, as you, you will see later, it really depends on the temperatures. So th that efficiency, I'm just giving you a typical automobile engine, but we will learn later that the efficiency depends on the temperatures of these reservoirs. That's what will determine uh, the efficiency. So we will see that later. All right, so what about any other question? Yes? Well, it depends on what the temperature of the reservoir is. So you will see that. It's intimately linked to the temperature of these reservoirs. So the, the, the lower you make the temperature of the low reservoir, the higher your efficiency will be. So if you can reach zero Kelvin, which you know it can't, in fact, that's because of the second law. Second law tells you you can never reach zero Kelvin, but you can get very close. So you could have a very high efficiency. It depends on what device you're dealing with. But it's intimately linked to these temperatures. We'll see that a little later. OK, so um, let's look at the second statement, the Clausius statement. Now, this obviously tells you something that you should already guess what it is. <laughs> the Clausius statement says that it is impossible, there's an S missing there, uh, to make a device which operates in a cycle and produces no effect other than the transfer of heat from a cold reservoir to a hot reservoir. Right, so in other words, it's, it's telling you that it is impossible to build this refrigerator with no work input. Impossible to make a device which operates in a cycle and produces no effect other than the transfer of heat from a cold reservoir to a hot reservoir. And there is the little cartoon of the same refrigerator moving heat from the cold reservoir Q sub L to a hot reservoir Q sub H it's impossible if there is no work. Even though the first law is fine, the first law is satisfied as long as these two heat transfers are the same, the first law is okay. But the second law says, the closest statement of the second law uh, says that um, it is impossible. Okay, so, uh, and remember, this is the statement that I made earlier. There is no problem with the first law. Q sub L, in the case of the refrigerator, the closest statement, if Q sub H is equal to Q sub L, the first law is satisfied. There's no problem. And if W net equals Q sub H, in the case of the heat engine that doesn't reject heat, then that's also fine as far as the first law. The problem is that these two statements tell us that they cannot exist. Because if they do, they'll be violating the second law of thermodynamics. So those are the two statements. Let me show you why I said earlier that they are equivalent. So to prove that they are equivalent, you would have to prove that if you violate one statement, you are, in an implicit way, violating the second statement. 
But they deal, they deal with two different devices. One is a heat engine, the other one is a refrigerator. So the only way to do it is to design a device that has both heat engine and refrigerator within one. So this device is, for example, this one. Let's just leave that there. Here is a device. As you can see, it ha there is two parts to it. Well, first of all, there is a hot reservoir up here. There is a cold reservoir down here. That doesn't change. And what I have then in between is the following. I have over here, I don't know if you can see that this last line is blue. This is a refrigerator operating in a cycle, removing energy from the cold reservoir and delivering energy to the hot reservoir. So this is a refrigerator. And this one over here is a heat engine. It's taking a certain amount of heat, Q sub H, from the hot reservoir, is delivering a net amount of work, and is rejecting some energy, Q sub L, to the cold reservoir. So which one is violating what? Is this heat engine OK as far as the second law? Yeah, there is no problem. Receives Q sub H, delivers a certain amount of work that we call W cycle, and rejects Q sub L. And in fact, the first law, again, is telling us here that the work is Q sub H minus Q sub L. This is a fine heat engine. It doesn't have any problems violating the um, second law. What about this refrigerator? This refrigerator violates the second law, violates the Clausius statement, right? because this refrigerator is taking Q sub L from the cold reservoir, is delivering it the same Q sub L to the hot reservoir, and that there's no war going in it. So while this heat engine is fine, this refrigerator is not. This, re this uh, heat engine respects the Kelvin-Planck statement. This refrigerator violates the Clausius statement. But now you do the following. You take, you see the dotted line? That's my new device. So my new device has inside of it the old heat engine, the refrigerator, and the cold reservoir. It's all inside my device. So this is my new device. This is my new black box. All right? So if now you examine that black box here, forget about what's inside, what do you see? is receiving a certain amount of heat from the, a net amount of heat from the cold reservoir because there is Q sub H coming in, Q sub L going out. As long as Q sub H is larger than Q sub L, there's more heat going in. But it's all coming from the hot reservoir. And it's delivering an amount of, a net amount of work, which happens to be Q sub L, Q sub H minus Q sub L. And there is no cold reservoir anymore. So this new device inside this dotted line is a heat engine that violates the Kelvin-Planck statement. So you can see how, by doing this combination of two devices, and a third device that is a combination of the two, you can show how if you have one device violating one statement, implicitly is violating the other statement. So there is no, they are connected. The two statements are really connected, even though they're dealing with two different devices, they're really producing the same result. All right, any questions about this? OK, yes? Why couldn't you just take the um, work coming out of the heat pump and just pump it into the refrigerator? Right but the, I don't have a heat pump here. The turbo pump on the right side. I could, I could, but it wouldn't serve my purpose. I, I, could, I could use this uh, work that is being produced by the heat engine and use it to drive the refrigerator. But then I would have two devices that are fine. They don't violate the second law, so I couldn't prove anything. Because right? remember, what I'm trying to do is I want to have one device violating one statement to show how that implicitly is violating the other statement. Right? If I do what you're saying, then I don't have a problem, because the devices are both in accordance with the second law. You can do the opposite. And I, I, will, I won't do that here, but I want you to think about it. You could do the opposite. Do something similar to what I did here, 
But instead of having a refrigerator that violates the closure statement and a heat engine that satisfies the Kelvin Planck statement, have a refrigerator that satisfies the closure statement, but a heat engine that violates the Kelvin Planck statement. So do the opposite. Start from a heat engine that violates the second law and then end up with a refrigerator that violates the second law. It's a similar analysis, but you can do it based on this one. Any questions? Any other questions? So to repeat what we said a moment ago, the Kelvin-Planck statement then implies that the efficiency of a heat engine cannot be 100%. You cannot have 100% efficiency of a heat engine. Whereas at the same time, the Clausius statement implies that the coefficient of performance of a refrigerator can never be infinity. It will always be less than infinity. All right. We said that already. This is a repetition of what, what we just said. So now, what are these machines? called that violate these, uh, these laws. Can I remove this? Uh, we call them perpetual motion machines. You may have heard of that. In thermodynamics, we speak of a perpetual motion machine of the first kind or a perpetual motion machine of the second kind simply depending on which law they violate. So if, I, if, if somebody designs or gives you a design of a machine that violates the first law of thermodynamics, then we call it a perpetual motion machine of the first kind. And if it violates the second law of thermodynamics, then it's a perpetual motion machine of the second kind. All right. We'll look at those later when we do some problems. I'll give you a device tell, and ask you to tell me if it violates either law or both. OK, um, moving on. We need to talk about reversible and irreversible processes. So what is a reversible process? We have seen processes. You have done already sufficient, a sufficient amount of problems involving processes. Those with um, cylinders, pistons, springs, whatever. You look at processes. And you typically have a process that goes from one to two. You go from an initial state to a final state. So now when do we call a process reversible? And here is the condition for a process to be reversible. A process can, is, rever is reversible if it can be reversed. That means if, it, if you can take the system back to the original state, but the key is that that's not all. You need to also return the surroundings to the original state. So it's essentially playing the movie backwards. That's a, if, if, you, if you have a reversible process, it means that when you reach the end of the process, you could undo everything, go back to state one with both the system and the surroundings going back to the original state. If only the system goes to the original state, but the surroundings don't go to the original state, then the process is not reversible. So yeah. but everything has to go back. That's why I say it's like really playing the movie backwards. It's, everything has to go back to the original state. You would not be surprised to know that, of course, there is no such a thing. Right? All real process are, processes are irreversible. There are many things that render processes irreversible. And many times you could take the system back to the original state, but not the surroundings. Surroundings will change. They will not go back to exactly the way they were. So all real processes are irreversible. And this is a list of um, reasons why real processes are irreversible, because all of these things exist. Friction, heat transfer through finite temperature differences, and perhaps most important of all, that processes take place in a finite time. 
Remember at the beginning of the course we talked about the quasi-steady process. It was one of the questions in the exam, right? Quasi-steady process takes place so slowly that it takes forever to finish. All real processes take place in a finite time. And by that reason, processes are, that contributes to the irreversibility of the process. The faster it takes place, the more irreversible it will be. Think of a, something burning, for example, very slowly versus something exploding very fast. How difficult it will be to put it all back together if it explodes very fast. So reversible processes are a key concept in the uh, study of the second law. As well as, as you have seen, the cycles, in particular the cycles involved with the heat engines and with the refrigeration cycle. So now, let's see how much time I have here. All right, I got plenty of time. So um, we're going to look at a very important cycle that can be both a heat engine, a refrigeration cycle, but it's also reversible. So we're going to look at the so-called ideal cycle. And this ideal cycle is called the Carnot cycle. This is the cycle against which you compare any other cycle that you design. The invisible cycle. The Carnot cycle. So we're going to, def we're going to define a cycle specific cycle, we're going to call it the Carnot cycle, and we're still going to see what it does. And this cycle is going to be made of processes that are reversible. So this cycle is only in our heads. Right? You cannot really build something that runs on a Carnot cycle, but it will be an ideal against which we can compare our real cycles. So first, first of all, it's reversible. We already know that's an idealization, but the Carnot cycle it's a reversible cycle. It has four processes, so it has four parts. Two of the processes are adiabatic. Another question on the midterm. What's an adiabatic process? There's no heat transfer. So two of the processes of the four that make up the Carnot cycle are adiabatic, whereas the other two are isothermal. So they be, and they will alternate. So there will be an, an adiabatic process followed by an isothermal process followed by an adiabatic process followed by an isothermal process. Another way to divide the four processes, so this is one way to look at the four processes, two adiabatic, two isothermal. But also, two of them are expansions and two of them are compressions. So if you combine the words, then you get the four processes. There's an adiabatic expansion, an isothermal expansion, an adiabatic compression and an isothermal compression. Right? So those four processes, which are reversible, that means I can draw them back and forth whichever way I want, constitute the Carnot cycle. And again, also very important, this cycle will operate between two reservoirs. So there'll be a high temperature reservoir, TH, and a low temperature reservoir, um, TL. So here is one way of thinking of, of this cycle, because it, you wonder, um, how can I make this? Well, here's one such way. None other than the gas in the cylinder problem that we have been, let me see if I can fit this whole thing in there. Here are the four processes of the Carnot cycle. So let's begin here. So first process is from one to two, then two to three, three to four, and then four back to one. And then it repeats, four, four cycles. So one to two adiabatic compression. Okay, so it's adiabatic, that means that it's insulated. Think of the cylinder being completely insulated. There is no heat transfer in or out of this gas, and you are compressing it. That's the first process. Then that's followed by a an isothermal expansion. So now you allow for heat to go in from the hot reservoir into the gas. 
so that the temperature of the gas remains constant because it's isothermal and it is expanding, so the piston is moving up. When that process ends at three, then you again make it adiabatic. So now you shut off the communication to the hot reservoir. This is insulated again, but it's still expanding. So, but now it's an adiabatic expansion, no heat transfer. Reach four, and then once you are at four, you're at the maximum volume. Now you start an isothermal compression. That is, you're going to compress the gas, but you're going to put your system in contact with the cold reservoir so that heat can be removed from the gas for it to remain isothermal while you compress it. And then you bring it back to one and then repeat adiabatic, continue the compression and so on. So that's, those are the four processes that make up a Carnot cycle. Again, two are expansions, two are compressions, two are adiabatic, two are isothermal. The combinations. So suppose that I say, well, let's plot this. Let's plot this on a PV diagram. We've done PV diagrams many times. Let's plot this process on a PV diagram. So we have a gas. Let's assume, you don't have to, but let's assume that it is an ideal gas. So I'm going to plot this process, these four processes that make up this cycle on a PV diagram, assuming that it is an ideal gas. And I'm going to see if I can fit it here. Maybe if I move this down. I can probably do a trick here. Hold this. So I can fit it right there. All right, so there is the four processes. P versus V, pressure versus specific volume. Where is the dome? Way to the left, doesn't matter, right? We're in the ideal gas region. And you, the numbers match. So one to two is the adiabatic, in the adiabatic compression, you're going here from one to two. It's a compression, the volume is decreasing, the pressure is rising, you reach this high temperature TH. Then you go from two to three. This is this process where you put the system in contact with the hot reservoir. So now energy is being transmitted from the hot reservoir into the system so that the system remains isothermal. So we follow this isothermal line from two to three during the isothermal expansion. Then we again shut off the heat exchange, it, it becomes insulated, and now we continue to expand, but now the temperature drops from three to four, because it's adiabatic, there is no heat transfer, and it's expanding. And then you're back at four, at the lowest uh, temperature, lowest pressure, and then from four to one, you compress it, but you allow it to release heat to the cold reservoir at Tisabel, and then you have the isothermal compression from four to one. And so there is your Carnot cycle, as it would look like for an ideal gas, yeah. undergoing the four processes. Again, you can see how the area shaded in here is the net amount of work yeah. during the process. Any questions? So this will be our ideal cycle. This is the Carnot cycle for an ideal gas. It will be the cycle against, we, with, against which we will compare any other cycles. Suppose you do it instead of for a um, an ideal gas, you do it for a saturated mixture of liquid and vapor. So suppose you do the Carnot cycle inside the dome, and I'll, we'll, we'll draw this one, I'll draw that one together with you. Um, so it's still gonna be an ideal Carnot cycle, but I will make it happen inside the dome. So suppose that I, and I'm gonna do the same plot, P versus V, I 
and here's the dome. Right? And uh, maybe we're going to have this one um, nearby as a reference. Okay, so I'm going to keep this one here somewhere so we can see it while we make the new one. Okay, so this was the Carnot cycle for an ideal gas. I want to make it now for a um, mixture of liquid and vapor inside the dome. And I'm going to help you by starting with the first point. So I'm going to put two here. All right, so that's two. And now I'm going to do, the next process is an isothermal expansion. So I have to expand isothermally from two. Where do I go? Horizontally to the right. But I'm not going to go all the way across because I want to have the entire process inside the dome. And I know that as I go from three to four, I still have an expansion. So I still have an increase in volume. So I'll stop maybe somewhere here at three. Then I need my adiabatic expansion, which is the next process. And I know that during that process, I'm going to drop the temperature from the high temperature isotherm to the low temperature isotherm. So I'll have to go somewhere down here to four. All right. And then I have what? An isothermal compression is the next one. You can also look at the list of, uh, if it helps you better, the list of the four processes. So we're just going um, two to three isothermal expansion, then adiabatic expansion. Now I need an isothermal compression. Isothermal compression, because, it, because I'm inside the dome, it'll have to be horizontal to one. And then, of course, a finally an adiabatic compression to take me back to two. Both are Carnot cycles. This on the right is the Carnot cycle for an ideal gas. And this one on the left is the Carnot cycle for a liquid vapor mixture inside the dome. Okay, maybe let's do one more thing. Questions? Okay, let's do, let me tell you one more thing, because this gets heavy, so. Let's just do one more thing. Um, the so-called Carnot propositions. There are two propositions that have to do with the Carnot cycle. So as you can see, a lot of the, very little in the way of equations so far with the second law of thermodynamics. There's a lot of concepts. The only equations were the equations for the efficiency and the coefficients of performance. Those are very easy. Everything else is very conceptual. Uh, so what are the Carnot propositions? There are two of them. So what we're trying to do now, now that we have defined this ideal Carnot cycle, now we have this ideal Carnot cycle, which will be our reference cycle to compare with. Then we can do the following. Suppose that the high temperature and the low temperature, T sub H, here I wrote T sub C, for, but we'll make it T sub L too. T sub H and T sub L. So you have, suppose you have those two temperatures fixed. The high temperature reservoir and the low temperature reservoir are fixed then you can have two heat engines. One which will be a Carnot heat engine and another one which will be a real heat engine. The Carnot heat engine is the reversible heat engine and the real one is the irreversible one. So these propositions are also fairly intuitive. It says that a reversible heat engine, that's what the HE stands for, is more efficient than any irreversible heat engine. It's obvious from what we have been say saying. That if you have two heat engines, one is reversible, is the Carnot heat engine, and the other one is irreversible, then the 
uh, Carnot heat engine will have the highest efficiency of the two. That's the first Carnot proposition for those two temperatures, TH and Tisabel. Now, if you have, again, fixed TH and TL, then any Carnot heat engine, even if it's a different cycle, it doesn't have to be exactly the four that we define, but as long as it's reversible, all of the Carnot heat engines will have the same efficiency. Again, that's intuitive. If the Carnot heat engine is the highest possible efficiency, then any Carnot heat engine or any reversible heat engine will have the same efficiency between those two temperatures. Those are the two so-called Carnot propositions, and here's a little cartoon to illustrate that. So for a given T sub H, and T, you make this T sub L again. Don't, let's try not to confuse you with different symbols. T Q sub L, Q sub L. So if you have a fixed T sub H and a fixed T sub L, the reservoir temperatures are fixed, and here's the two engines, a reversible one and an irreversible one. So R stars for reversible, I stars for irreversible. And here is the uh, real work, and here is the ideal work. I'm sorry, the irreversible work. Then the uh, work that comes out, you know, for the same Q sub H, for example, for the same Q sub H, the work that comes out of the irreversible heat engine will be less than the work that comes out of the reversible heat engine. So this one here will be less than the work that comes out of the reversible heat engine, which is shown here on the left-hand side. Those are the two Carnot propositions. So unless somebody has a question, I'm going to leave it there. When I come back on Thursday, we'll see a, little few, a few more equations that have to do with the second law.